You know, every generation, God raises up a handful of warriors to fight the good fight and encourage others to do the same. Dr. Robert Jeffress is pastor of the historic First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. The church was founded in 1868. Dr. Jeffress has served as senior pastor since 2007, walking in the footsteps of great heroes of the faith such as George Truett and W.A. Criswell. I have no idea how you follow a legend in the pastorate, but this man has. He just led his church through a successful $130 million building program, making it one of the largest local church building programs in American history. He's become one of America's most outspoken evangelical leaders and has consistently taken an uncompromising stand for truth, but always seasoned with grace. He's become a frequent guest on most of the major national news programs from the mainstream to CNN to Fox and continually speaks the truth in love. And Dr. Jeffress is not afraid to challenge his fellow clergymen. Let me give you a sample. Dr. Jeffress said this in an article titled, Pastor Wimpy Won't Cut It in the Culture War. And I quote from our speaker this morning, many clergy falsely perceive Christ as this little wimpy guy who walked around plucking daisies and eating bird seed and saying nice things, but never doing anything controversial. The fact is, Jesus did confront his culture with truth, and he ended up being crucified because of it. Wimpy pastors produce wimpy Christians. And that is why we're losing this culture war. I believe it's time for pastors to say, you know, I don't care about controversy. I don't care whether I'm going to lose church members. I don't care about building a big church. I'm going to stand for truth regardless of what happens. (laughs) I'm introducing to you not Pastor Wimpy. Would you please welcome this man of God who's come from Dallas, Texas to minister to us. Please welcome Dr. Robert Jeffress. God bless you. Thank you so much. It is a great privilege to be here with WRFD, a great radio station. I appreciate Bob and Tom's uh, invitation. And uh, before I begin today, I want to recognize a very special guest here. She has been a lifelong member of our flock in Dallas and just recently moved to this area. She served with her late husband for 32 years as a missionary to Taiwan. I've known her all of my life because I grew up in First Baptist Dallas, and she's been a member there all of her life as well. She is a great servant of God. Betty Tomlinson, I want you to stand up, and I want us to honor you today as a great servant and faithful servant of Jesus Christ. God bless you, Betty. Salem Broadcasting loves pastors. And that is why they're having this gathering today. And they are also convinced of what I'm convinced of, and that is there has never been a time when the role of pastors is more critical in our country than today. You are on the front lines of battle. And the reason I say at this particular time in our nation's history is what I want to talk about today. I've come to the conclusion that America's collapse is inevitable. And there is nothing we're going to do to stop it. I came to this conclusion actually a couple of years ago through something that happened in our own church. Bob made reference to this massive uh, building program we undertook in which we were going to recreate our campus on six blocks of downtown Dallas. And in order to do that, we first of all had to remove a million square feet of space and six old buildings. And so the question was, how do you bring those buildings down without bringing down the surrounding skyscrapers? 
And so we met with the demolition people, and they said the best way to accomplish this is through an implosion. And they explained to me what they were going to do. They said, we're going to take 200 pounds of dynamite, and we're going to attach it to key structures in these six buildings. We'll explode the dynamite. There'll be a delay, and then the buildings will collapse upon themselves. I said, well, that sounds pretty good to me. Let's go for it. So on a Saturday morning a couple of years ago, they closed downtown Dallas, and uh, we and the media stood on a nearby building overlooking the complex. All of the media was there. CNN was there. Fox was carrying it, or actually around the world. We were told later on that 17 million people around the world were watching the implosion. And I'm telling you, it was very, very exciting. I stood up there with the mayor of the city, and we had the big red button, and they did the countdown, five, four, three, two, one. We pressed the button, and the explosions of the dynamite went off just as planned. And after the explosions of the dynamite, there was nothing. Nothing happened. I cannot tell you in that moment how embarrassed I was. My first thought was, and pastors, you'll understand this, my first thought was, who am I going to fire first for this? I mean, here's the whole world watching this. I could see this scene being replayed endlessly on YouTube. Pastors, implosion, a dud. But I'd forgotten what the demolition people told me, that there was going to be a pause. And actually, that pause that seemed like eternity was only a few seconds. Because sure enough, There is a roar that began, and I can only compare it to like standing next to a jet engine. And it got louder and louder and louder. The ground began to vibrate. And within 30 seconds, those once massive buildings collapsed upon themselves and were turned into nothing but a plume of debris and dust. I learned something that morning about implosions. They are sudden. They are dramatic. They begin with a series of seemingly unrelated explosions followed by a delay and then a collapse. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last 50 years, there have been three explosive decisions by our Supreme Court that have so weakened the spiritual and moral infrastructure of our nation that our collapse is inevitable. These three decisions have done more to determine the direction of our nation more than any mandate by Congress or any executive uh, order by the White House. These explosions have already occurred. The implosion is coming. We are simply living in that period of delay before the final collapse. What are these decisions? The first decision, the first explosion occurred in 1962. It was the Supreme Court case of Engel versus Vitale, which removed prayer from the public school. Now, of course, this was just the beginning of a long series of decisions by the court that demonstrated the court's not neutrality, but hostility, not just toward religion, but toward Christianity specifically. And, of course, the culmination of those decisions was in 1980 in Stone versus Graham when the Supreme Court deciding the case in Kentucky about the posting of the Ten Commandments said that it is unconstitutional to post copies of the Ten Commandments in a Kentucky school. And what was their reasoning? If I simply paraphrased what the court said in their ruling, you would think I was making it up. You would think I was speaking in pastor hyperbole. So I want to read to you a portion of the Supreme Court's decision about why it's unconstitutional to post the Ten Commandments. The court said, and I quote, If the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it will induce the school children to read, meditate upon, perhaps venerate and obey the commandments. This is not permissible under the Establishment Clause of the State of the First Amendment. I mean, can you believe that? The Supreme Court said we cannot post copies of the Ten Commandments because if we do, the students might actually read them, venerate them, 
And God forbid they might actually obey the commandments and that's unconstitutional. I don't think it is a coincidence that 17 years after this decision in the hallway of a Kentucky school, before school began at Heath High School in Paducah, Kentucky, a group of students had gathered together to pray as they did every morning before school. And while they had their heads bowed, a 14-year-old gunman, a student who had obtained a gun, opened fire on this group of students, seriously wounding five and killing three. It all happened in a Kentucky school where the Supreme Court had said 17 years earlier, you cannot post the words, thou shalt not kill. Now, what is amazing about this is 118 years before that, the Supreme Court had said, quote, why may not the Bible and especially the New Testament be read and taught as divine revelation in the school? Its general precepts expounded, its evidences explained, and its glorious principles of morality inculcated. Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? That was 118 years earlier, and now the court said, you can't even post the Ten Commandments. How did we allow this to happen? It is because we have ceded control of this country to the godless and moral infidels who want to separate this nation from its spiritual heritage. You know, what we've allowed to happen is this. We have allowed the secularists to absolutely rewrite the Constitution. What does the Constitution say? You know what the First Amendment says, the so-called Establishment Clause. It says, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Our forefathers had come from from Great Britain where there was a state church where everybody was forced to join the same church. They were coerced to worship. And the First Amendment simply said, you can't do that. You cannot have a state religion. I recently wrote an op-ed for Fox News that said, what we've allowed the secularists to do is to rewrite the Constitution and change the word establishment to the word endorse. And we've changed Congress to a local school board or any government entity, and we have said government can't have anything to do with religion. I want to tell you how preposterous that is. People often cite... Thomas Jefferson and his famous wall of separation between church and state. Two weeks ago on a Wednesday night, I was in Statuary Hall of the United States Capitol with Mike Huckabee and Ted Cruz and Michelle Bachman, Tony Perkins and others, and we were having a prayer service in Statuary Hall. Many people don't realize that the first worship service in Washington, D.C. was held in Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol. They met there every week For 70 years, it was the largest church on the East Coast for many years. Do you want to know who it is that authorized the use of the Capitol every week for Christian worship services? It was President Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson saw no conflict between this wall of separation, which he understood to mean the establishment of state church and the government's endorsement and sponsorship of the Christian religion. But ladies and gentlemen, even if the Supreme Court had ruled correctly in all of these cases about religion, do you think that changes God's mind at all? Do you think God looks at the United States of America and says, oh, you have a constitution, you have a First Amendment, well, my principles don't apply to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something about God. He is no respecter of people or nations. The First Amendment does not supplant the First Commandment that says you are to have no other gods before me. God is the same yesterday and today and forever. I said this in the Capitol. I had the Marine Band right to the right of me. They had just played the Star Spangled Banner. And I said, with all due respect, you need to understand, God does not get goosebumps when he hears the Star Spangled Banner. God does not stand up and salute when the American flag passes by. 
God is no respecter of people or nations. Any nation that reverences God will be blessed by God. And any nation that rejects God will be rejected by God. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The second explosive decision was in 1973. It originated in our own city of Dallas, I'm sad to say. It was the decision, Roe versus Wade, that legalized the murder of more than 50 million children inside of the womb. And that rate continues at 1.3 million children who are murdered every year through abortion. Now, I know what the conventional wisdom is. In fact, I was meeting with a very influential senator a couple of weeks ago about this very issue. I know what the conventional wisdom is, even among conservatives. Well, we just need to pipe down about these social issues, like abortion and marriage, because all people really care about is the economy. Well, let's look at that for a moment. Let's talk about the fiscal ramifications of abortion. One study I read said that if these 50 million children who were murdered through abortion had been allowed to live and they had turned into tax-paying and productive citizens, they would have generated anywhere from an additional 35 to $70 trillion in our gross national product. If these children had been allowed to live and contribute to our society, there would be no Medicare crisis, no Social Security crisis. You cannot slaughter 20% of your population without severe fiscal ramifications. Well, ladies and gentlemen... The fiscal financial fallout from abortion pales in comparison to the spiritual fallout. All you have to do is look in history and see how God dealt with nations that killed its own children to know how God is going to deal with America. We were in Israel recently. Many of you have been there. And we drove by the Valley of Hinnom. Jesus referred to as Gehenna. And in that valley, you remember the Israelites sacrificed their own children to the pagan god Moloch. And because of that, God raised up the Assyrians and later the Babylonians to judge his own people. If God's own people, the Israelites, are not going to be spared the judgment of God, do we really have to wonder how God's going to deal with America for the murder of its unborn? In later years, we saw how God raised up the Nazi forces to crush, uh, the Allied forces to crush Nazi Germany because they took children to the crematoriums by the train loads. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not a question of if God is going to judge America for this. It's only when. The final decision, the explosive decision, occurred in 2003, Lawrence and Garner versus the state of Texas. This was a decision that struck down our state's anti-sodomy laws. Now, I know conservatives are a little squeamish about this, saying, well, do we really want the state regulating what happens in people's bedrooms? I mean, shouldn't the government stay out of the bedroom? What's interesting is the reasoning that was used to render our laws unconstitutional. And back in 2003, Anton Scalia, who was in the minority, made this prediction. He said, this ruling leaves on pretty shaky ground state laws limiting marriage to opposite-sex couples. He proved to be prophetic. Because it was that ruling that has been used in case after case to overturn bans on same-sex marriage. And I believe we're just one Supreme Court decision away from seeing all restrictions against same-sex marriage lifted. Now, people say, well, what's the difference? I mean, if gays want to marry and so forth, what harm does that do anyone else? All we have to do is to look at studies by the Hoover Institute. They've studied over a long time period Scandinavian countries that legalize same-sex marriage. And you know what they found? They found not that many gay couples actually ended up marrying. What they found was the rate of heterosexual marriages dropped precipitously in countries that legalize same-sex marriage. Why is that? Because whenever you counterfeit something, you cheapen the value of the real thing. 
People understand, well, if marriage is whatever you want it to be, two men, two women, three men, and one woman, why bother to get married at all? Last year, we saw the marriage rate at its lowest level in United States history. And that has tremendous social impact on children. You know, uh, in 1885, the Supreme Court actually said nothing could be more wholesome and necessary than that government which sees the family as, quote, consisting in and springing from the union of life of one man and one woman in the holy estate of matrimony. Our forefathers understood that the family was the basis for a healthy society. Then we saw just this last June... The Supreme Court striking down basic provisions in the Defense of Marriage Act. I remember that night very well because I was on O'Reilly that night debating the decision with a gay activist. And I was pointing out that even sociologists say that a heterosexual marriage and relationship is important for the successful rearing of children. I quoted Sarah McClanahan from Princeton University who said if we were trying to design the ideal arrangement in which to rear a child, it would be one in which the child was connected to both of its biological parents. Now, Princeton University isn't a bastion of conservatism. But they understand that both a father and a mother are necessary for the successful rearing of children. Well, my opponent in the debate, debate that night on O'Reilly said, I'm offended that you would suggest that a heterosexual relationship was superior to a homosexual relationship. And I said, with all due respect, sir, you wouldn't be here tonight. You wouldn't be alive and breathing if it were not for a heterosexual relationship. Nature itself shows us that is normal. That is what God has ordained. Now, my point in this is simply this. No nation that outlaws the mention of God in the public square, that sanctions the murder of its own children, that destroys the most basic unit of society, the family, no nation can survive that. The explosions have already occurred. The implosion is coming. What are we to do in the meantime? Now, I know probably some of you are thinking, this is the most depressing message I have ever heard. (laughs) This is supposed to encourage pastors. Let's just pass around the revolver right now and get it over with. (laughs) I want to share with you a word of hope, because never has there been a time more critical for pastors than right now. Because Jesus told us exactly what the mission is. He told us exactly what we're to be doing right now, and it's found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said... You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made tasty or salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You understand, you preachers, that in Jesus' day, before refrigeration, salt was a preservative. Now listen to this. Salt did not prevent the decay of the meat. It only delayed the decay of the meat. Eventually, the meat did rot and it had to be thrown out. But the salt gave the meat a longer shelf life. And Jesus said, in the same way, you are to be salt. You are a preservative in the world in which you live. You're not going to prevent the decay of the culture, but you can delay the decay of the culture so that you have time to fulfill your real mission. And I believe that's what God has called us to do. He has called us to, on one hand, push back against this godless, immoral society that is replacing light with darkness. We are to stand up and push back. We are to delay the premature destruction of our country. Now you say, no, wait a minute, Pastor. Delay the decay and collapse of our country? Well, Pastor, don't you believe in the sovereignty of God? Don't you believe that God has written an indelible ink on His calendar the day of America's collapse and there's not one thing you're going to do to change God's sovereign plan? Don't you believe that? Yes, I believe that until I read my Bible. Because in Jonah chapter 3, I find the story about a man named Jonah. And God said to Jonah, I'm going to destroy the wicked city of Nineveh. 
But in Jonah 3.10, it says God changed his mind. God relented of his decision. Now, I don't understand that. Maybe the Logos software has an answer to that. I don't understand that. I, I don't get it. But here's what I know when I read the book. God said he was going to destroy Nineveh, but because of the righteous actions of Jonah, God delayed his decision. He gave Jonah more time to preach the gospel. More people were saved. Now, what's interesting is God eventually did destroy Nineveh, but he delayed the decision to give people an opportunity to repent. That is what God has called us to do. He said, you are the salt. You know, I don't understand what is developing in the church today, I call it silo spirituality. And it says, you know, my faith is a very personal thing. It's okay to share my faith with my family or even church members, but for me to use my faith to try to influence other people or non-Christians or the course of the nation, why, that is unchristian, unkind, and it may be illegal. I just can't do that. Where did we come up with that kind of theology? Ladies and gentlemen, for salt to affect meat, it has to penetrate the meat. It has to be up next to the meat. Look at the Old Testament. Look at the New Testament. When you look at the great prophets of God, and pastors, God has called us to be prophets. Look at the great prophets of God, whether it be Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, or John the Baptist. They just didn't speak to their own people. They didn't just speak to the people of faith. These prophets of God were willing to stand up and confront ungodly leaders and an ungodly culture and say without stuttering or stammering, thus saith the Lord, and we're to do that as well today. God has called us to push back against the evil. How's the best way for us to do that? How do we push back against evil? Well, one way we do it, pastors, is by that dirty little word, Nobody wants to speak about. And that's the word politics. How many of you have had members in your church say, well, I don't think Christians ought to get involved in politics. And I sure don't think you, pastor, ought to get involved in politics. Do you know what that word politics means? The root word means to control or to influence. When you say Christians shouldn't get involved in politics, what you're saying is Christians shouldn't get involved in trying to influence the culture in which they live. Can anybody say that and believe that? I mean, we are to influence our culture. Every now and then somebody will say to me, some of these saints who are holier than God, do you have those in your church? I have them in my church, you know. They're holier than God. They say, well, no, you know, Pastor, don't get all worked up about this. Just pray about it. Just pray about it. You know, in 1 Timothy 2, Paul didn't try to affect any change. He just said, pray for your leaders. We just need to have a big prayer meeting and pray for our leaders. That's what we need to do. Just pray, just pray, just pray. And I point out, with all due respect, the only reason Paul said the only thing to do is pray is because in Paul's day, that's the only thing you could do about your leadership. When Nero was on the throne, he wasn't there by popular election. All you could do is pray. But as John Jay the first chief justice of our Supreme Court said, God has given us the privilege of choosing and selecting our leaders. And that means when people go into the voting booth, every time they go into the voting booth, they are either casting a vote for righteousness or for unrighteousness. The next time somebody says to you, I don't think Christians ought to get involved in politics, I want you to ask them these three questions. Do you think God cares about his name being outlawed from mention in the public square. Do you think he has any opinion about that? Do you think God cares about the rampant immorality that is engulfing our country right now? Do you think God cares about 50 million children murdered in the womb? Do you think he has any opinion about that? If your answer is yes, you've just explained why Christians ought to get involved in politics. Last year, last election, 2012, only half of evangelical Christians registered to vote. And of those half who registered to vote, only half of those actually voted. Ladies and gentlemen, if God's people would stand up and vote not Republican values or Democrat values, but God's values, we could turn the direction of this country around overnight, at least in the short term. 
Don't forget the mission. God says we are to be salt. But the only reason we're trying to delay the decay of our country is so that we can do what God has really called us to do, and that is to be light. Matthew 5, 14, he said, you are the light of the world. I want to make this very clear. Our mission is not to save America. Nowhere in the Bible is there a mandate to save America. Our mandate is to save Americans from the coming judgment of God by introducing them to faith in Jesus Christ. That is what the mission is. And there has never been a better time in American history to do just that. Ladies and gentlemen, have you come to grips with this fact? That the only reason God has left us here on earth is to fulfill His agenda and not ours. You know, a lot of Christians get mixed up about this. They forget why they're here. And I always like to ask people, have you ever thought about this? Why isn't it that God didn't rapture you to heaven the moment He saved you? You know, people say, well, our mission is to have fellowship with God. Well, now, if that was the mission, why didn't God take us to heaven? He could have much better fellowship with us up there than down here, couldn't he? I mean, down here we get distracted by all these other things and by sin and competing agenda items. God's ultimate desire is to have perfect fellowship with us. But think about this. He was willing to delay his gratification. He was willing to temporarily suspend his ultimate desire for us and leave us here for one mission. And the reason he left us here wasn't to build a successful career, a big financial portfolio. He didn't even leave us here to have a happy family life. He left us here for one reason, and that is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many people as possible. That's the mission that God has placed us here for. You know, Paul understood that mission. After his confrontation with Christ on the road to Damascus, he was never the same again. And he understood the mission very well, and he viewed every circumstance in life through the prism of that mission. Remember what he wrote in Philippians chapter 1? Here he was in prison facing what could have been his execution. He said, this is great. I rejoice because through my imprisonment, the gospel of Christ is even going further than it's ever gone before. Now, I want you to think about this. If Paul's purpose in life had been that of most of your church members, peace, prosperity, pleasure, and the avoidance of pain, if that had been Paul's purpose statement, then his imprisonment would have been a great tragedy. It would have been a detour in his life purpose. But Paul had a purpose bigger than himself, the spread of the gospel. And because of that, he shared the gospel with as many people as possible. And then he turned to those Philippians in chapter 2 and he said, And as for you, in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation, you are to be children of light, holding forth the word of life. God has given us a mission statement to share the gospel. You know, I became convicted about this several years ago. I said, you know, to myself, you've got this great church, this massive campus, big budget, big staff. But what are you really doing to introduce people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? You all know we can just keep church going and going and going and going without really accomplishing much of anything. And I became convicted about what I was doing where I was. What strategy, what plan did I have to carry out the one thing God had left me here on earth as a Christian to do and as a pastor to lead others to do? And so I developed a little strategy. I said to our church, you know, I want to ask you to partner with me in something. Six weeks from now, on a Sunday, I'm going to preach the very best message I can preach to help people understand how they can come to know Christ as Savior. And I'm going to ask you to partner with me. And if you will bring a non-Christian with you that day, I promise to do the best job I can with God's help to preach a clear message if you'll do your part of bringing a non-Christian here. And so we planned a little thing, a little lunch afterwards and so forth to see what would happen. When the day rolled around, we had a thousand guests who came that day, people who didn't know Christ. And when I gave the invitation, 200 of them accepted Christ for the first time. Now you say, well, I don't like that strategy. Th that wouldn't work in our church. Fine. What's your strategy? 
Come up with your strategy. There may be a better one for you, but we all need a strategy to do the one thing that God has called us to do. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, the preservation of America for the proclamation of the gospel depends upon local churches fulfilling their mission. And I want to remind you of something. I'm so grateful for all of these sponsors for this event. We couldn't do it without you. They are wonderful helps to the body of Christ. But I want to remind you that every other Christian organization on the planet was created by men. Doesn't mean they're not good, but they are man-made organizations. Only the local church is God's creation to carry about the Great Commission. The local church is primary. And that's why God has entrusted us, the church, with fulfilling that mission. The preservation of America for the proclamation of the gospel depends upon churches fulfilling their mission. And the ability of churches fulfilling their mission depends upon pastors, you, fulfilling your calling as a prophet and as an evangelist. The good news is there's never been a better time to share the gospel. You know, Paul said to the... Philippians said, in the midst of this perverse and crooked generation, you are to be children of light. Remember who was on the throne when he wrote those words? Nero. Nero, who used Christians as human torches to light his garden. He said, you can rejoice in that. Because as this world becomes darker and darker, the light of the gospel shines that much more brightly. You see, Paul understood a very basic principle, and that is the darker the background, the brighter the light. The darker the background, the brighter the light. I, I, I saw that principle illustrated a couple of years ago, my own life. My daughter, youngest daughter at that time, was about 20 years old. And uh, I told her one day, honey, I want to help you celebrate a big event in your life. Something big had happened in her life. And I guess I'm far enough away from it right now, I can tell you what it was. She had broken up with her no good, worthless boyfriend. And I was so excited. I mean, I was thrilled. So I said, Dorothy, I want to help you celebrate. And so I'm going to take you to the mall, and I'm going to buy you whatever you want. Now, I want to explain to you what I had in my mind when I said whatever you want. I thought about going into Forever 21 and buying one of those $20 or $30 dresses, you know. So we go to North Park there in Dallas, and she leads me right past Forever 21 into a jewelry store. A very expensive jewelry store. So we're standing there at the counter, and finally the salesman comes up, looks at my daughter and says, it's good to see you again. I knew I'd been had at that moment. He said, would you like to look at that ring you were looking at yesterday? She, he, she said, yes. Yeah. So he went back. He came back out with this box, opened it up. But before he took the ring out, he took a piece of black felt and placed it on the plexiglass countertop. And once that black felt was laid down, he took that ring and plopped it right in the middle of that black felt. And the contrast between the blackness and the light of that ring almost blinded me to the price. Not quite, but it almost <laughs> blinded me. I mean, it was a brilliant contrast there. But you see, that guy was a master salesman. He understood the principle. The darker the background, the brighter the light. And that's what Paul is saying to us. As this world becomes more hopeless, the light of the gospel shines that much more brightly. That's why it's never been a better time to share the gospel. Now you may be saying, Pastor, this is the most schizophrenic message I have ever heard in my life. I, I can't tell what we're supposed to do. I mean, are we to be pushing back against the culture? Or are we to be sharing the light of Jesus Christ with as many people as possible? Which is it? Well, what did Jesus say? He didn't say you are to be the salt of the earth or the light of the world. He said you're to be salt and light. Pastors, Christians, we've got to learn to multitask. We've got to learn to do both things that God called us to do. Erwin Lutzer has become a great friend of mine. He read a book of mine a couple of years ago, the manuscript of it, in which I talk about some of these principles. He called me afterwards. He said, you know, Robert, when you and I were at Dallas Seminary, 
we were told that what we needed to do was just preach the gospel, preach the word of God, and leave all these other things to other people to do. Just preach the gospel. That's what we're to do. He said, I'm still convinced that our primary job is to preach the word of God. But he said, if we don't start doing a few of these other things, we'll no longer have the freedom to preach the word of God. Don't ever forget, the Apostle Paul preached the word, but he also spent two years entangled in the Roman legal system fighting for his rights to preach the gospel as well. It's not either or, it's both and. We are to be balanced in our ministry. But ladies and gentlemen, don't ever confuse the word balance with passive. This is no time for God's men and women to be passive. I think of the words of William Watkins in his book, The New Absolutes, who said, it is time for God's people to violate the new tolerance and become known and marked as a people of intolerance. Not an intolerance that unleashes hate upon people, but an intolerance that is unwilling to allow error to masquerade as truth any longer. An intolerance that is willing to stand up and call good, good, and evil, evil. May God give us the courage to do just that. Thank you very much. Well, that was not Pastor Wimpy. We're going to have a short question and answer session, all right? Just short. You got two Baptist preachers up here, but we're going to try to do it short. I'm going to ask Dr. Dr. Jeffress to sit to my right because I don't think he's been to the left of anything. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> First question. So what do you really think of Tim Tebow? No, 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 no. No, I'm not going to get into that. All right, here's the first question, all right? With your insane schedule, I was a little worried when I saw the word insane in this question. With your insane schedule, how do you make time to be alone with God and spend time with family? Yeah. You pastor one of the largest churches in America. You're on TV all the time. About every other night I see you there. How How do you do sermon preparation and spend time with your family? Look, Every pastor is busy. Everybody in this room is busy, and I understand that. So it's the same for all of us. We may be busy with different things, but if we're a pastor, our primary job is to preach the Word of God. My predecessor at First Baptist Dallas, Dr. Criswell, was there for 50 years. And um, David Jeremiah told me this, said he had asked Dr. Criswell, how do you stay at a church for 50 years? And Dr. Criswell said, it's very simple. Save your mornings for God. And by that, he always set aside his morning time to do his studying and preparation. And he told David, and he's told me and others this, if you will save your mornings for God, you'll be fresh in the pulpit. You'll always have something new to share your people. But when you start to shortchange that time with God and the time in God's word, the people will notice it very soon, and you have to leave. And so that, that I would say, put the big rock in the in the uh, cistern first. And that big rock that I put on my calendar is that time in the morning with God. Follow up to that. Describe your study regimen for your weekly sermons. Yeah. Walk us through how you develop a sermon. <laughs> you know, there's some people, I was reading the late uh, James Montgomery Boyce, who, you know, I have great respect for and read. Um, he's in heaven now. He used to wait till Fridays. He would do his sermon prep on Fridays and Saturdays. That would drive me crazy. I mean, I could not do that, but it certainly worked for him. Mine is I like to start early in the week, and I'm, I'm starting Monday looking at the text, reading through the text, letting God speak to me before I open up the commentaries. I'm, I'm not one of these pastors who can work a lot ahead of time and know what I'm preaching, you know, um, six months from now. I lay the series out. I know pretty much where I'm going, but I'm pretty much, you know, being chased by the hounds every week. What's the most important advice you could give to a young pastor just beginning the ministry? I'd say, number one, 1 Peter 5, 8, be on the alert, be of sober spirit, know your adversary the devil prowls about. 
And we all want to say, because it's politically correct to say, well, you know, the plumber in your church, the attorney in your church is just as much under attack as you are. No, he's not. Maybe a different kind of attack, but I think Satan prioritizes who he goes after. And I think he goes after men and women in ministry. You know, if a plumber falls, it doesn't make the front page of the newspaper. But if a pastor falls, everybody knows about it. And it discredits Christianity. So I'd say be a word of that. Be sure to keep your own relationship with God fresh. You're in the word not just for sermon prep, but to get to know God better. And you're preaching out of the overflow. And the third thing I would say is have a group of men who are praying for you regularly. The best thing I ever did in my ministry was about 15 years ago. I started what I called the Pastor's Prayer Partners. And we had several hundred in my previous church. We have 350 in our church in Dallas, men who pray for me and my family and the church regularly. They're divided up into teams. When I'm preaching in the pulpit, they're in the prayer room praying. That has done more to revolutionize my ministry than anything. I understand Spurgeon did that. At times he would have 800 men yeah. praying for him while he was preaching. Yeah. I've debated all morning whether to ask this, but every pastor can identify with this question, mm -hmm. everyone. How do you handle the strange or just plain weird members of your church? <laughs> so, someone told me a long time ago where there's light, there's bugs, and every church has them. How do you handle them? <laughs> Well, that was, my, that was my favorite quote from Howard Hendricks, my mentor for so many years. And boy, How many can I identify that, with that? Isn't that the truth? Oh, there. yeah. All right. So what you do know, you do with them? You need to be compassionate with them, but you cannot allow them to eat up your time and eat up your energy. Uh, you have to be nice about it. But, um, you know, I don't feel like, especially these people who write these two and three page emails to you and want you to research this for them and so forth. You know what? This may sound unchristian to you, but when, and I've got great deacons so far, they, they'll want me to answer or look up something for them. And they never stop to think, what if every church member wanted to do that? And I said, you know, I know the answer to this, but it would make you a better student of the word if you dug it out for yourself. So, you know, what I'm saying is don't let other people detract you from the ministry God has called you to. And God has called you, if you're a pastor, to preaching the word. And the need of the many is more important than the need of the one or two. And you've got to be tough about that. That sounds uncompassionate, but it's not. God has called us to be uh, shepherds. Uh, uh, and that means handling a flock, not just one individual. You dealt with this partially in your message this morning. Um, but I want you to elaborate on it. Um, I can say two words. Mitt Romney, or two names, Mitt Romney, Tim Tebow. And those two names created incredible <laughs> criticism for you because of something that you said or something you handled. Both of those were huge nationwide things. Your name was everywhere, drugged through the mud by millions of people and all the major news outlets. How do you handle criticism? How do you handle it personally? I grew up... Um my dad, as a hobby, played the accordion, and so I asked him when I was five years old if I could take accordion lessons, and so I spent my teenage years uh, going to every bar mitzvah and wedding in town, you know, earning money by playing the accordion, and let me tell you what. So this is how you handle criticism? If you you if, learn the accordion? If you're in, playing the accordion as a teenager in the 1960s, let me tell you what, uh, you learn not to care what anybody thinks about anything. That's, that's the game. You develop a tough skin early in life has been my secret. Look, the serious Did you ever is, play the beer barrel polka? I can play it in such a way it'll make tears stream down your face. Uh, now, I change it when I do it in church, and I've done it in church. We have to change it in a Baptist church. It's the root beer barrel polka. So, I, you know, we're still a little legalistic about that. But, uh, no, you, you, look, you have to understand that uh, you ultimately answer to God and God alone and uh, not to other people. And, you know, the Mitt Romney controversy, it wasn't about Mitt Romney. It was about a question I was asked. I didn't go out of my way to criticize Governor Romney. I was asked in a press uh, meeting, uh, had a 
50 reporters around me, is Mormonism a Christian religion? And I said, no, it is a cult. It is a theological cult. That's about sharing the light of Jesus Christ with people. So that, that was about that. And Tim Tebow is a wonderful Christian. I have great respect for Tim Tebow. I think he made a bad decision and so forth. And, uh, but that's between him and the Lord. I have nothing bad to say about Tim Tebow. We're talking about balance and balance not being passivity. Let me go a little deeper into something you just said. How do we engage the culture, which obviously you are advocating, and I think we should. How do we engage the culture without alienating the culture? A lot of culture warriors in the evangelical world have not only engaged the culture, but the way they did it, they have alienated. Yeah. I don't believe you've done that. So what is the balance, the passionate balance? Well, I need to send you a link to some websites <laughs> because, I mean, what I have found is I think we need to be kind. I think we need to be a velvet-covered brick as much as we can. Uh, we need to speak the truth in love, but we still need to speak the truth. And, um, you know, uh, people say, you know, why is it when you're on television debating these guys, you know, David Silverman from the American Atheist and so forth, you never get mad, you smile and so forth? Well, it's because I know I'm standing on truth. I mean, I don't have to argue with somebody, and I think we just need to be kind about it. But I have found this, Bob. I don't care how compassionate you are, how kind you are, if you ultimately tell people there's only one way to God through faith in Jesus Christ, or that marriage is between a man and a woman, they're still going to hate you for it. They're not going to accept it because you're smile, compassionate, and so forth. Just be ready for it, uh, that when you uh, speak truth, you're going to be criticized. And I think about Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't get crucified for telling people to turn the other cheek. I mean, you all understand that. It wasn't because he went around saying nice things. He got crucified for saying things that went against the social norm of his day and claiming to be the son of God. So, I mean, don't fool yourself into thinking by being kind and compassionate, you're going to win over people necessarily. Final question, because I know you have to go, but um, scriptures tells us to be contented in all things. Mm -hmm. And a pastor, wherever God has placed him, whether it's a small church, large church, mega church, needs to be contented. Yeah. But how do you remain contented without being complacent? If you become complacent, obviously you fail, the church fails. So how do you stay challenged and challenge a congregation but remain content? We've got a lot of people here that don't pastor a mega church like you do. And yet that's where God's called them yeah. to be. They need to be contented but not complacent. Well, I would tell you this. You know, I've pastored three churches every size. I've my first pastorate after I left the church I pastor now, where I was a youth minister back in the 70s and 80s, my first church was a county seat town of 5,200 people. It was a very, very small church. It was a great church. I was there for seven years. And then I was at my next church in Wichita Falls, which was a large church for 15 years. And then I came to Dallas. And, you know, I'll have to share this. You know, there were times when I was in the first church that, there was a lot of pressure. I think in many ways the pressures on a pastor in a small church are greater than in a large church because in a small church, you feel every bump along the road. There's just not that cushion that sometimes comes from a larger church. So I think it's the greatest challenge in the smaller churches. And there were times I wanted to get out, and I'm going to tell you, every time I tried to get out, I couldn't get out. And what I have found is, now this may not be true for everybody, but any time God moved me someplace else, it had nothing to do with any of my efforts. God is the one who picked me up and moved. And I would just say to pastors, don't be looking for, you know, a, a greener pasture somewhere. If the grass is greener, it's probably because it was better watered or mowed than where you are now. And um, just do the ministry God has called you to do. God is sovereign. He will pick you up and put you where he wants you to be. I Amen. can testify to Amen. that. Amen. I hope you'll pray for Dr. Jeffress. Uh, God has raised this man up for such a time as this. I don't know of anyone today in the evangelical world that has more exposure to the news media than Dr. Robert Jeffress, and he's handling it in an incredible way. I've never once heard him compromise truth, never whether it's O'Reilly or whether it's, you know, CNN or whatever. But he does it with graciousness and love and balance and passion. 
and I hope you'll pray for him in the ministry of First Baptist Church in Dallas. And thank you all for sharing your morning with us here. We're honored that you would be here. God bless you and your ministry. Thank Dr. Jefferson again, please.